I'm Christina Rea, and welcome to Breaking Out of Breaking In, a practical filmmaking podcast about taking your creative career into your own hands and making great work that gets seen without playing the Hollywood game. Or at least while changing the rules. Hi, I'm Brie Castellini, your other co-host, and today we are breaking down writing for television with guest Kira Jones. But before we dive in, we just want to quickly remind you that we have a new free monthly newsletter, which you can find at the bottom of breakingoutpod.com. More details on that on the website. But without further ado, Kira, welcome. Please introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, Thank you, Christina and Brie, for having me. Uh, I'm Kira Jones. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a screenwriter. Um, I'm currently a writer on the second season of Hulu's Woke and on ABC's Queen. Yes, welcome. Yeah, welcome. (laughs) <laughs> we're yeah, we're so excited to have Kira here. We've been talking about having Kira on for a long time. And we were glad when we started doing season two that we had a perfect thing to talk with her about. So this is our far higher series. So Kira, can you tell us a little bit about your first staff writer position, how you got there? And specifically in your case, how you got staffed from outside of LA? You were in Chicago at the time, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yeah, still in Chicago, actually, for the next couple weeks before I officially moved to Los Angeles. Um, Yeah, so my staffing story is extremely unique. I truly don't think anyone else has the same story as me. (laughs) I have checked. Um, I asked around, but how I got staffed on Woke uh, was completely unexpected. I had been submitting my pilot Good Vibes Only to a, a number of competitions. I placed highly in some, I won a few, and um, was li- just waiting. Because the way that these competitions market themselves, they're like, and then execs and reps will just be beating down your door, ready to <laughs> assign you. Crickets, nothing, heard zilch. Um, but <laughs> I, against my better judgment, one more time decided I was gonna enter something, uh, mostly because it was free. So I entered <laughs> Coverfly Pitch Week, which is this really awesome program that Coverfly does, uh, I think like twice a year, where you can submit for free. All you have to do is make a Coverfly profile and have a couple of projects uploaded on there. And um, they'll choose a number of writers, like 100 uh, to 150 writers uh, to participate in Pitch Week. And then they, the participating execs and reps will choose from the list of writers that Coverfly is curated and set up like 20 to 30 minute kind of mini generals with them. It says pitching, but you're not really pitching. Mm, And yes. So I was ready to pitch. Everyone was just like, so how's your day? What's your life like? (laughs) Um, But uh, one of the pitches that I had of the four pitches ended up being with one of the execs that produces Woke. And Mm. so we had a really amazing discussion. Um, she and I got along really, really well. So like shout out to Lauren Kahn, who was working for Coverfly at the time, but is now writing on a TV show herself. So she left Coverfly like right after she basically made my life better. But she <laughs> she connects. She was like, I really think Kira's script would jive with this exec that she knew personally and made that connection. So that's one of the wonderful things Coverfly can do is really make the personalized like, oh, this writer writes this type of stories. We know an exec who's looking for these types of stories and put y'all together. And so they did that. And she'd mentioned just like as an anecdote that Woke was staffing for their last position and they were really looking for a queer black woman and they were having a really hard time finding one. And after our meeting, she sends me an email and she's like, actually, are you interested in being staffed? Because I can you know, send your script to the showrunner. And anyone who was an aspiring screenwriter knows, or even a professional screenwriter knows <laughs> that you, so much of your time is spent spending, sending your, scripts into the abyss Mm -hmm. to never be heard (laughs) from again and so I just assumed this was going to happen again so I was like yeah sure whatever like send my script to the showrunner yeah sure (laughs) um I got an email the next day that's like they love your script they're going to reach out to you and it'll be soon because the room is going to start like quickly I didn't know what quickly meant I thought you know maybe in a couple weeks no this was Wednesday when I got that email I got the call from one of the producers who said hey we need to meet with you tomorrow because the room starts on Monday oh my god I had a full-time job at the time so I had to move some stuff around and uh figure out my life (laughs) like preemptively in case I got this job 
So I binged the first season. I'd already seen it, thankfully, but I binged it again to prepare for the interview. Did the interview, got a call an hour later that was like, hey, get a, an entertainment lawyer because we're about to send you this contract. We want, we want to staff you. I did not have one. Mm-hmm. Um, my <laughs> uncle, who was a retired public defender, negotiated my contract <laughs> for me. But I didn't have to pay him. That was nice. He didn't get no 5%. I sent him some whiskey and it was good. But um, <laughs> so that is how I ended up getting staffed on, on Woke through a, a what was supposed to be a, not even really a general, kind of a general. Um, and then the next day I was a staff writer. So that's incredible. That's, yeah, um, <laughs> so do you mind telling us a little bit about like what that contract looked like, what your uncle had to negotiate on your behalf um, and, and sort of like what that that process was for people who, who might not know what to expect from the money and the commitment for uh, your first room? Yes. So a lot of the staff writer contracts are going to be pretty standard WGA, like the uh, legalese, uh, for lack of a better <laughs> word, payment for sure is WGA standard. So um, there's a minimum that they have to pay per week. So it's a, you get paid weekly. Okay. It depends on your level. So staff writer is the, the lowest level in the writer's room. Um, it also depends on how, on how many weeks your room is going to be. So the longer your room is, the less they pay you per week by like a couple hundred Got dollars. It. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. So for woke, because the room was 12 weeks, I got paid a little bit over 5,000 a week, but on Queens, because the week, the room ended up being over 20 weeks, I was getting paid like for about 4,500 a week. Okay. Um, so that, as far as payment, like you could just go on the WGA website and like look at their, uh, they call it the schedule of minimums to see what you'd be getting paid. But the next level up from staff writer is story editor. And that's a like significant pay bump. It's like, over seven thousand dollars a week. Oh wow. From. wow! So that's how much I was getting paid. Some other things to be aware of. So woke tried, not woke, but the studio that produces them, Sony. They tried to put it in my contract that I could not develop any of my own content while I was writing for woke. Wow. Um, so and typically shows will put you unless it's a limited series where there's only going to be one season. They will sure. sign you for three seasons. So, or they have the option to bring you for three seasons. They could, so they could technically be like, we don't want to bring you back, but like technically you are, if they want to bring you back for the three seasons that they have you signed, you have to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's plenty of writers that get out of it. Like on I feel like for the most part, studios are like, if (laughs) we don't want a disgruntled writer on our show, they really hate being here, Mm -hmm. but uh, that's something to be aware of. And so they, but they wanted to put it in my contract that I could not develop for potentially three years and yeah, I was that's like wild yeah. yeah yeah and I don't know how standard that is or not and that's something where I wish that I had actually found an entertainment lawyer and did not have my uncle do it but like I pushed back on that because he was telling me all the terms and everything he didn't know what was like standard or what was something sure. bogus but I, that sounded bogus to me and I was like nah like mm-hmm. I want to I want to stop on the show but I don't want to not be able to create my own projects for three mm-hmm. potentially three years so he did push back on that and then what instead I got a first look so now before I can develop with anybody else so say you universal is like we want to develop your pilot before I can even let like go into negotiations with them I have to let Sony make an offer on a project and then go through negotiations. Um, So the thing is like, it's not like a done deal. If Sony wants it, it's not like they automatically get it. They have to negotiate. And if they can't, if they don't meet terms that are agreeable to me, then I get to move on to somebody else. So I also have that in my contract with Queens, which is through ABC Signature. So I have two first looks. It's very annoying. So I have to go (laughs) to Sony first and then to ABC before I can go anywhere else. So that's something to be aware of. Like your lawyers can try to get that taken out of your contract. And I think it's easier once you have moved up the ladder and maybe you're at a your story editor or co-producer level, they might not try to put that in there, but um, it is really frustrating <laughs> to, to like, cause you want, you like, if you're planning on developing your own show, you want to be a creator or showrunner someday, you really do need that experience having on a show. Like it's mm-hmm. more likely that your show will become a reality if you have staffed on other shows, but then you kind of get 
trapped into not being able to develop when you're staffing on shows, depending on your contract. Yeah. So what constitutes as development in that case? Like, is it just if you're moving forward with like a quote unquote traditional like union production or like, because I know you're working on a a feature right now. Like how, how does that fall into things in terms of that like weird non-compete language? Yeah. You know, I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure. I know. So for me and my contract, it's the first, the first look is only television. Got so okay. I can do whatever I want with features. Like I, mm-hmm. I can independently produce or I could go through a studio if I wanted to, but it's just TV. But uh, yeah, so like if I have a pilot that I want to sell to a studio and or network, I can't do that until I've given Sony and ABC the opportunity to make an offer on said project. Okay. I mean, I guess, you know, it's it's not the worst thing in the world to have people like guaranteed to read your work. But I, I imagine if you want to have flexibility that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, like at first I was like, it can't be that bad. Also like Sony, that's amazing. Uh, something to be aware of with studios and networks right now is that there is just a, this phenomenon going on in the industry where networks and streaming platforms only want to work with their own studios for the most part right now. Like it used to be Mm -hmm. studios could sell their projects to anybody. It didn't really matter. Even if they had their own uh, network that they were, uh, that they used for distribution, they could also distribute with other places. For now, I've been like, I've been going on all these generals. And when I talk to the Hulus and the stars and the whoever Mm -hmm. else, they're like, yeah, we don't really buy shows from outside studios as much anymore, especially not Sony. Hmm. Like Sony is on more than anybody else is on this weird island because they they really don't have the, they don't have their own streaming platform. I don't know mm-hmm. if there's bad blood with Sony and these other networks and streaming platforms, but I've talked to some networks that are like we don't even hear pitches from Sony, <laughs> let alone buy them. So hmm. Sony just like to put it out there is a lot of their projects are sitting on the shelf right now because um, huh. networks don't buy them. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some studios that are like universal that are still like still seem to have pretty good relationships with these networks and people will still hear their pitches and buy their shows. But if you want to, if you want your show on Amazon, best bet is to go through Amazon studios. Mm-hmm. If you want your show on Hulu, best bet is to go through Disney, ABC signature or something like that. So like start thinking about what's the ideal network for my show to be distributed on and figure out uh, what studios that they work with rather than, you know, having to learn the hard way that you went with the wrong studio and you won't be able to be distributed on the platform that you were helping to That's That's really really good to know. Yeah, really good to know. And something that, you know, the average writer wouldn't know. I mean, I'm learning it the hard (laughs) way. (laughs) And we appreciate you sharing this knowledge. So let's talk misconceptions. We were kind of talking before we started recording about misconceptions that some of your current show's fans have about the whole process. So for people outside of maybe the, the... the room, the industry, whatever, what are some misconceptions that people have had about writing for TV and and the work that you're doing now? Oh my God. So many, so many misconceptions. Um, One I think is like how collaborative it is. Like you are in this room or on zoom with a bunch of different people with different perspective, different ideas coming up with a story together. So I think the biggest misconception is when people see a writer's name on an episode, be like, this was written by Kira Jones or whoever, that like they made every single decision in that script. And that, that they got to like come up with everything on their own and they just went off and wrote it. No, absolutely not. Um, before even you get to put your fingers on a keyboard and write a script, there's... Um, the blue sky in process, breaking, like literally everyone is in the room with pitching ideas for what should happen in that episode. And at the end of the day, the showrunner is the one who gets to decide which of that like melting pot of ideas becomes the episode. And so that big twist that you loved in that episode, Bob might have not have come up with that. That might have been the right. little staff writer. That could have even been the assistant that came up with that. 
So that's the first thing. So if you're mad about something in the script, don't take it out on the person whose episode it was because <laughs> it might not have been their fault. It could have even been something the actor improvised. Like you don't, mm-hmm. you have no clue. So if you're gonna be mad at anyone at the end of the day, be mad at the showrunner because they could have <laughs> stopped whatever that thing was. So if you need to direct your anger, direct it to the showrunner. Right. Um, <laughs> That's the first misconception, how much power the writer of the episode has, which is is not that much. More misconceptions. Well, for specifically for for queens, people think that we, well, they think Eve is dead. She's not, spoiler alert, okay? She's not dead. (laughs) Um, They just turned off the episode when we did a fake out when they thought that she was dead, but Uh like she wasn't dead. But they acted like we made the decision of our own volition to sit that character out, even though they're aware she is pregnant. Like she <laughs> even realized is pregnant. She's on maternity leave. So mm-hmm. that is why this character had to sit out for some of the like later episodes of the season. And everyone is up in our DMs, in our comments, like, when's Eve coming back? When's Eve coming back? I'm like, bro, she's pregnant. <laughs> like, when she's not pregnant anymore, and also when she feels like it, like, we are not going to force newly uh, minted Black mother mm-hmm. away from her child to come and dance <laughs> on, a, <laughs> on a soundstage, okay? Like, I, we're, we're going to leave that decision up to her. So it just, I think, like, the demand that production happen on the schedule and how the audience wants is like kind of ridiculous. I, I, I like I wouldn't call somebody's job while they were pregnant and ask when they were going to come yeah. back. Yeah, I, yeah, I feel like in TV, especially true, because it's such a long term commitment, and because it takes so long to produce a single season, so many things that you don't have any control over as the writer, or even the showrunner affect what you're able to put on screen. Like I know, certainly the longer that I'm in the industry talking to people, the more I notice in TV shows where like, all of a sudden, something really weird is happening. And like a character that seemed to have a really clear arc, just gets like, you know, hard left turned. And it's like, I think something went on in contracts. This person must not be available anymore. So they must have had to rewrite it at the last minute. And I think that's what a lot of probably lay audiences don't realize is that, you know, you could have every perfectly brick laid moment. But if something happens, if somebody gets pregnant, if somebody gets hurt, if somebody gets another project, if you know, whatever, so many things will have to change because you have to maintain your production schedule. Yes, especially for network, because Mm -hmm. like they're airing one episode at a at a time and your uh the writer's room overlaps with when production starts so woke was streaming queens is network we finished writing woke before it went into production a couple of weeks before it went into production we started the writer's room maybe like a month or two before production started and then we were writing at the same time as things are being produced so there's such a there's such a tight schedule because it's like your air date is this date like you must get this episode done by, there's no time to go back and fix things necessarily. Whereas mm-hmm. you might be able to do that with streaming. So it really is a fantastic and scary lesson <laughs> in thinking on your feet and problem solving, writing for a network show. Another misconception I think people have, which I have accidentally set screenwriting Twitter on fire by telling them this, I don't understand how this was a controversial statement, but somehow it was. But traditionally in past years, especially when network TV was king, writers would be on set. They would go to set, especially for for the episode that they wrote to help produce that episode. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely important experience to have, especially if your goal is at some point to be the showrunner of your own show. And because you have to have film production experience, you have to understand how sets operate, you have to understand more than just right, it's not just writing at that point, like, you are the boss of everybody, you're the boss of the directors of every episode, like you have to be overseeing everything, you need to know what budgets are, you need to know things. And to save money, I guess a lot of the streaming shows, and even some of the cable shows are no longer sending individual writers to set. They're just making the showrunner cover set for all of the episodes. And so there are more and more writers that are climbing up the ranks of the room, like go, you know, going from staff writer, story editor, even up to co-executive producer that never get to go to set and never get that experience. Wow. And then wow. once you are in uh, consideration to be a showrunner, the 
these execs are going to ask, what is your onset experience? And if you don't have any, they probably will not let you be a showrunner, at least not mm-hmm. on your own. Mm-hmm. Um, they might, if you are lucky, they might give you a co-showrunner, somebody who has more experience, but they more than likely they're just going to pass over you for somebody else. And so network TV is one of the few places where I consistently see the writers being sent to set, even the, the like baby staff writers <laughs> like me. And so if you want that experience, if you want a better chance of being a showrunner one day, you I would suggest working on a network show, at least for one season, just to see how that works, because you don't want to, I, I think, I think it also informs your writing to see sure. what, how, what you think of in your brain and are putting on paper translate to what like real humans have to do or build or, or perform on set. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I was gonna bring that up uh, since I saw your your on fire screenwriting Twitter <laughs> wake. People were so like, mean to me. I was like, what? <laughs> what were so? What were people saying? Like, I only saw you reacting to people because then I read your original tweet and I was like, what is? What are people upset about? Yeah, I, I don't didn't understand get it either. <laughs> I mean, for the most part, people were like, Kira is right, especially professional TV writers, but there were some sure. people that were like, whoever said that they wouldn't write for a network show? I'm like, I. First of all, I I know people outside of Twitter. Like I wasn't reacting to <laughs> a specific tweet. Although I have seen people talk shit about network TV on Twitter, but like I've heard real human television writers say that they would never write for a network show. So that's what I was just generally responding to people sure. um, that I, I've heard that sentiment multiple times. So some people were just say accusing me of writing a tweet just to go viral, but like making uh, shit like up. straw manning mm-hmm. somebody. Yes. Yes. Got and then it. there were some people that were like, there's nothing wrong with not wanting to write for network TV. And I was like, I'm not saying that you have to, but I'm saying <laughs> if you want onset experience, that you have a better chance of getting it there. I did not say like network TV is better than everything else. I said specifically <laughs> that if you want onset experience, go there. I don't understand how it got warped into like whatever the few assholes that made it into something else did but it, somehow that happened i mean screenwriting twitter is on another level certainly yeah. since the beginning of the pandemic christina and i for our patreon did a recap of the 2021 screenwriting drama because i have started to archive it <laughs> so <laughs> now we, we we keep track of every individual you know bolded slug lines beat is no longer acceptable remove all the beats from your script like all of that stuff i keep track I There's always it. people who ain't got no money. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm not going to listen to broke bitches. Like, <laughs> have you produced anything? Have you written in a room? Have you got, like, have you bought a con? It's nothing? Okay. So. Mm-hmm. And not to say that there aren't plenty of brilliant writers who have not done those things, but it's like, you are trying to give a prescriptive advice about an industry that you don't have experience in like you are not mm-hmm. talking to ex- like execs aren't telling you not to bold slug lines execs are telling you to take the beats out like you were just making things <laughs> up or maybe you're like screenwriting professor who himself is a failed screenwriter is telling you this like why would you listen to him he doesn't know <laughs> i also think a lot of times nobody should take the advice seriously at all and even the person who tweeted it was probably just like saying something to maybe their 30 followers and then you know everyone wants something to be mad about now so we blow everything out of proportion for absolutely no reason and that's when everybody absolutely loses their shit the wildest uh- <laughs> one was the uh, what was his name sean tweeting that like showrunners look at your twitter and might not oh, hire yeah. you if that you're was- an asshole quite the couple People of days. People were so mad. They were like, how dare they not want to work with me even if I am a cruel asshole? <laughs> <laughs> like, no one wants to work with you if you're an asshole. Like, I... Yeah, that's yeah, not just a TV why this thing. Be an exception. But. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, so speaking of onset stuff, so obviously we kind of mentioned this already, but like you're working on a feature right now. That's how you and I reconnected after a couple of years. But originally, you and I knew e- of, re- of each other, knew each other. I don't actually remember because of a web series that you co-created called The Right Swipe. So, can you tell us a little bit about sort of your background in indies, how you got started there, and how you have seen your experience there, and what you learned and developed inform what you're doing now in in writer's rooms? 
Yes. I am an indie ass bitch. Love an indie production. Also hate it at the same time. <laughs> sure. Yeah, uh, which is how the, we know you're a real indie producer. Okay. Yes. Hate the money <laughs> part of it. Hate the trying to get the money part. Um, sure. That I hope I never have to crowdfund again, but I'm sure I probably will at some point. So the right swipe was my first foray into honestly screenwriting period. Like I'd taken some screenwriting classes, but had mostly been focusing on my acting career and got connected to the indie web series scene through acting. I did, um, I acted in a few series, uh, one called Seeds, that's on OTV, um, another one called Capricorn, which is on Reverie. And I was like, oh, wow, like these are people of um, diverse identities with really cool stories to tell that are you know behind the camera like entire crews that uh look like me and the people that I share community with like I'm not used to that because as an actor I'd mostly been doing you know television or commercials and just like a sea of white men in the crew (laughs) and so I was like if 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 they can do this and and be successful maybe this is something that I I should pursue as well so I ended up teaming up with a friend of mine from college Julie Delpreet and we co-created uh, The Right Swipe, which is a web series that follows two best friends who start a business where they fix men's dating profiles, but then end up screwing up their own love lives in the process. And that was, um, I will say like a very fast process for an indie web series, like straight up from like the time we came up with the idea to when we finished principal p- photography, it was like, the 10 months maybe wow wow uh and then it premiered that following april so it was like really quick for for most people especially for a web series of that quality it's going to take a lot longer than that but i learned it was trial by fire because i had not seen any of the behind the scenes like production workings of anything before i was like oh yeah i'm sure we can produce this with like $5 $5 in a dream. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'd never crowdfunded before. I never done, never seen a budget and I don't know how that worked. And I, I, I know that I annoyed the shit out of our producers. Cause I was just like, well, why does this cost all this money? I saw this other web series didn't cost as much money. Why is ours more money? This is, I just need to, I now know just to shut up and listen to the producers, but yep. uh, did not know yep. that back then. But the nice, one of the, great things about indie web series is that you get to tell stories that a lot of the time big studios or networks would turn down and show them that like there really is a a market and an audience for these types of these types of characters these types of communities and because of that the right swipe was so attractive to so many Chicago filmmakers. They were like, because if you are in production in Chicago, the type of things that are being shot here, it's a lot of commercials. It's a lot of procedurals. It's the, it's gotten cooler. There's cooler stuff that's shooting here now, I will say within the last year or so. But it was like the Chicago PDs and meds and stuff that's not particularly artistically fulfilling for most creators, but like pays your bills. So when there's something like, the right swipe or another really cool web series that comes along people are like yeah i, I want to do this even though i'm maybe not getting paid as much as i would for a commercial like this is just artistically fulfilling for me and it'll give me um something to put on my resume that i'm really proud of or like y- give you an opportunity to try a different position that then you're usually getting hired for. Like maybe you're a PA most of the time, but you want to be a script supervisor. Like people are more willing to give you that opportunity to explore that role on an indie set than they might on a um, big network set. So I, uh, yeah, I learned, (laughs) I learned how to write in a way that is producible on a small budget because and now I feel like that's like stuck in my brain. Oh, and yeah. producer brain's a killer. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I'm like, no, I can't write that. It's going to cost too much money. And it sometimes can stifle my creativity a little, a little bit. But I think it also is really great for projects that I know I'm going to want to produce myself. I'm like, I have an idea of how much this type of camera is going to cost. I have an idea of how much each actor, uh, their rate is going to be. So how many actors do I need? <laughs> this? Like, So I highly suggest, even if you're like, indie film is not ultimately going to be my bag to get experience that way, like independently produce 
at least even if it's just a short so you, you have that uh experience and i think i don't know if i answered that entire question. no yeah, that was totally. that was great and i think we were we were also curious because you were talking obviously about like how important onset experience yeah. is if you want to move up to showrunner so like yeah. has your indie cred like was that useful to you in your coverfly meetings has that been useful for you in the room has it been useful for you when you've been on set for these bigger budget projects uh, yes um I think especially writing with a partner on the on the right swipe, it's similar to having a mini writer's room. Like it's not, sure. there's somebody else who is contributing ideas that may be better than yours, or maybe you can elevate what they're pitching. There's another voice there. And I think like that is such a culture shock for so many writers that are used to just being in their room, typing solo, not even really having too many other people read their work to go to a writer's room and have a lot of different voices from the other writers to the showrunner to the execs to the audience to like it's just you so um, independent producing even if you don't have a writing partner there's still going to be other voices there's still going to be your director your producers your actors who have something to say about what they also have a hand in creating so was already used to doing that which was great and then I think, you know, especially down the line, I do want to be a showrunner. And so I have the onset experience in, in multiple avenues as an indie creator, as an actor, uh, as a writer on the set of Queens. And that's only going to make uh, my resume stronger and make them more likely to give me that position. Because it's especially hard when you are a person of uh, marginalized identity, if you're a woman, if you're a person of color, if you're a queer person, like they don't want to give you mm -hmm. showrunner, <laughs> the showrunner roles. So it, it sucks that you have to be twice as good to get half as far, but you you really do and so like you can't you really can't just stroll into the showrunner role as a me as a queer woman of color and expect that they're going to give it to me without me really having proved that I can do it right yeah this is something that comes up a lot in uh we, we uh, last episode we talked to a, a director who does tv movies and she was talking about how sometimes she has trouble because you know if they put her in too much of a box that's the only thing they'll ever let her produce but if she's like oh I want to try a thriller they're like okay go make yourself a thriller and then maybe we'll hire you to do one for money and it's like how often do we have to prove ourselves Christina's brought this up a lot where anytime somebody's asking Christina for you know samples or whatever and she wants to produce something they're like oh well go make a proof of concept and she's like I've made 14 short films in two features and it's ridiculous yeah. yeah it's we had a similar experience with go to the body my feature which i'm sure mm -hmm. you'll ask more questions about but one of the times that i interacted with brie around this project was when we were pitching we were, we were in a pitch competition for the chicago international film festival which we got connected oh, to yeah. through the chicago independent producers lab oh. that my uh producer angelique ross was doing with full spectrum features. She was in the inaugural class. This was uh, the project that she was oh, doing okay, was, was go to the body. And we had always planned even before she started the lab to do a proof of concept. And we, I believe we're the only, definitely the only black people, but maybe the only people of mm -hmm. color in that whole class, or at least like visibly POC. And I think um, you might have been. Class. It was, that was an experience. <laughs> yes. Yes. The, I think the panel was all white too. And I actually wasn't even supposed to be there. Christine, I took over for Christina. Yeah, for oh, <laughs> so um, like, it's also there my was fault. A black, there was a, there was a, uh, at the actual, oh, yes, pitch, you're there right. was a black woman. Um, uh, yeah, I think there might've been one. Yes, there was one. And the white people that ended up being at the final uh, panel were great, but the ones in the practice questionable but but anyway in the in the independent producers lab the lab we were doing whatever angie would bring up that we were going to do proof of concept the other participants were like why would you do that why would you just not like make the film they were all white and especially <laughs> one of them i won't name her name is like uh she's a indie producer slash director and has a very strong industry connections through merit the person she was married to Mm. and she was the loudest one being like I don't understand why you need a proof of concept like why wouldn't you just go get the money I'm like oh you think they're just gonna throw money at yeah. three black women who have never produced a feature before they're not going to and we just kept getting like oh I don't understand why that's necessary but then I went to a webinar with it was with Casey Lemons and Gina Prince Blythewood two of the mm. most foremost 
black women directors right. in mm-hmm. history. And both of them said, like, even after they had their first big hit, they had to make proof of concepts for uh, to get funding for the, their next films. I'm like, okay, after Love and Basketball, you still had to do another proof of concept. And she said she had to do a proof of concept for Love and Basketball. Casey Lemons had to do one for Ease By You, I believe. Oh, yeah. um, mm-hmm. And so it's like, the, the, the game is different. For I have to play mm-hmm. harder than you. I can't just go to my my rich ass, successful husband's friends and tell them to give me money. I don't, that's not, that's not how I'm going to get to where I want to be. And it's unfortunate but it's true. And I think knowing that and preparing for the industry to be unfair, if you are a minority, it's unfair period, but it's going to be worse if you are a minority. Just, just gird your loins and go in (laughs) and hoping for like expecting the worst, but hoping for the best. (sighs) So it's the same advice that everyone's always getting. And I think everyone's hoping that there will be one person that's like, no, just do whatever you want. Just be talented and they'll get jobs. And it's like, okay. And sometimes that that does happen. Sometimes that does happen, but don't expect it to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's like posting something and hoping it'll go viral. It's like you're only going to go viral if you make screenwriting Twitter mad, but in like a really specific way. So, you know, maybe don't plan for that. By being (laughs) correct. Be correct and make screenwriting Twitter mad. And then like all the actual uh, TV writers and showrunners will follow you and all the like wannabes will hate you and probably harass you but it's fine (laughs) just something to expect so so speaking of like your own work and obviously coming from a position of having a lot of creative control and then moving into spaces where you're being hired to somebody else's vision and project for you like what is your approach to finding your like kira footing on a project that isn't your own great question i will say the feedback i get the most from execs and showrunners and just anyone who reads my work is that I have a very strong voice. And that's usually the reason that people hire me. Uh, And so I tend to get hired for shows that are in line with with that voice. There are some writers who just are chameleons. And if you look Mm -hmm. at their resume, it seems like they like been all over the place, genre wise, story wise, just because then they're being hired because they don't really have a voice, which is like its own skill. Like they can match the voice of whoever is running the show. I am um, y- gonna get hired for things that, where my unique voice is going to complement and, and uh, elevate the voice of the creator. Mm, sure. So I kind of go in knowing, knowing that. I have to remember like, this is not my show. I'm not here to fix it. I'm not here to change the direction of it. I'm here to help execute the showrunner's vision in the best way possible, but knowing like my perspective is going to help them do that. So I don't make myself smaller. I don't shrink myself. I don't like change my social views, political views or anything like that in the room. But I I also don't try to like commandeer the story. But if something comes up and I'm like, hey, I have lived experience in this and nobody else in the room does. And I feel like they're taking it in a direction that could be problematic or offensive. I'm going to say something. And sure. every time I've done that, like everyone, like the writer, the showrunners and other writers have been appreciative. If you're in a room where they're not appreciative of that, then that's their problem and not yours. You can be like, sure. all right, at the end of the day, like they're going to do whatever they want to do, but like, don't say it and warn you. Right. So I just think about like, where in the story do my skills fit the best so is it like pitching for this one specific character like am I the most similar with them or do I have the most uh ideas about them then like I'll speak up the most about that or if it's like if you have a background in in hip-hop and you're on a show like Queen like where can your vast encyclopedic encyclopedic knowledge of rap complement that just remember like there's a reason you were chosen for that room and sometimes it takes a little bit of time to figure out like what that reason is you can also ask somebody like um usually this is the writer's assistant like because they're sitting back and observing everything buy them a coffee talk to them like they'll give you the tea and they'll tell you because they know what the showrunner thinks of you too because they're talking to the showrunner on a one-on-one basis and that was really helpful for me on woke i i talked to our assistant amanda and she was like this is what you're really good at you're really good at making our characters humans. Like somebody will pitch a new character and they'll be 
at the beginning stages, like maybe a little tropey and you'll be in there like, okay, this is how we can make them like unique <laughs> and like lived in and feel authentic. So you figure out on, along the way what your special skill is. I have uh, two questions that are kind of similar. One is when you're in a room, are you solely focused on writing for that room or are you also finding time to develop your own projects outside of being in the room? So far, it's mostly been, I've been focusing on on the room. It was more like, I was still trying to figure out what a room was and how it worked because I got thrown in so fast and I didn't have the experience that a lot of other writers have as like coming up as an assistant and working my way up. And I got, during Woke, I was like bombarded with 19 agents and managers that wanted to sign me. So I was taking a hundred meetings. I was also still working my full-time job. Wow. While I was working, I dropped down to part time, but like, so I had two jobs. It was taking like three meetings a day. I was, I don't have time for anything else, but I was still, there were still some other, I'm still working on go to the body. I was still, I, I was um, developing a short that went into production in the two weeks between woke and Queens. <laughs> okay. um, very lucky timing. But so with the writers room being remote at the moment, there is technically more time than you would normally have. They tend to know that Zoom fatigue is real. So we were only working like five, six hour days on Zoom. So like there there would have been time if I had it wasn't doing a bazillion other things to develop some other stuff. But days can definitely be longer and, and more um, time consuming when you are in person in a writer's room. From what I hear, I don't know yet. Right. Uh, my other question was about ideas. Like if you what your approach is to making sure that you're bringing your best to a room while also keeping the pieces that are for your own work, I guess, sacred in a way. Do you have, do you have trouble balancing that? Or do you like when you're in a room, do you just put it all in? And if you have an idea that you thought could be for your own thing, do you throw throw it in if it could work for the series? That's also a really good question. I, I don't necessarily filter. I mean, I guess like I tr- if I've already started developing a project and I have specific ideas for that, I I tend not to pitch those for the show I'm writing on. But mm-hmm. it doesn't like my but I don't completely cut those that sever that cord. Like I have a lot a lot of my life experience is in the shows that are the projects that I am personally developing, but sometimes that life experience is useful for the room. So like, just because my pilot is about sex doesn't mean I can't pitch sex things <laughs> to <Right. laughs> uh, the show that I'm currently on. But it is, it, sometimes you come up with ideas in the room that do not make it into the uh, show you're writing for. And you're like, hmm, okay, I can save this for my own pilot or for my own feature. Uh, yeah, it, for me, it's a little bit more fluid, but I think it, everybody's different. Okay. Makes sense. So yeah, let's talk about remote right now, since obviously you got staffed well in Chicago. And I, I know you obviously love Chicago from your Twitter feed. It seems like it's a, it's a place that you, mm-hmm. you know, it's your place, but you are now moving to LA. Can you tell us a little bit about like what went into that decision? What finally was like, all right, I got to move. Yeah. I mean, part of it is that I just don't know what's going to happen with this industry, whether rooms are going to stay remote for the foreseeable future or if they're going to start being back in person again. My guess is that there will be still be some rooms that are remote. I like I feel like a lot of the old school writers really want to believe that it's going to go completely back to how it was before as it, with in-person rooms in LA. And I'm like, I don't think it I don't think it completely will. But I do think I don't think they're all going to stay remote. So I don't really have a reason to stay in Chicago other than that. I love it here. And I wouldn't want to cut myself off from potential rooms that I would really love to work in because I'm not in LA. However, like if I had a kid, if I had a family and kids and other reasons to like root myself down here, it's nice to know like I, that there will still be opportunities in one form or another, like, even if you decide not to move. So more is just like time to, to go just so I'm not cutting my career off or making things harder for myself when I don't necessarily have to. It is also just strange even being remote, like never meeting my coworkers, never mm-hmm. meeting my manager, never 
five, my managers are five. Like the people that I talk to the most are people that I can't just go grab a coffee with. And uh, I would like to be able to build more community with people in the television industry. And I just like, can't really do that here unless I want to set up a million Zooms, which is cool, but like it's impersonal. You can't, it's very hard to build a more intimate relationship with people um, sure. over Zoom. And um, I'm cold. <laughs> <laughs> I like I don't I didn't really feel that upset by the Chicago cold until quarantine where I was like jealous of all my friends in LA that could like go take a hike in February and I was like I have developed a a, a vitamin D deficiency because I've been in my house so much and not seen the sun for extremely long periods of time so I'm like let me not make myself extremely ill (laughs) just go (laughs) somewhere where I can like be out in the in nature every now and then have you been the only non-LA person in both of your rooms woke I was the only non-LA okay. person which made me sad because they all went out for dinner without uh. me <laughs> um there's like sorry Kira bye um <laughs> I still have yet to meet anyone from that room Queens I was not the Queens is actually okay. kind of sprawled all over the place most of the writers were in Los Angeles but there were two in New York one one I think in New Jersey and one in Miami and then me so like it wasn't oh, wow. just me so that that was cool were they like all originally in LA and just because of the pandemic they were further flung but had already made connections like I'm just curious how especially that many places different places making up a single room how that came together two of them were originally in LA and then went elsewhere for the pandemic to be closer to family or or, um, what have you but the two New York people were just in New York one of them actually (laughs) used to live in LA hated LA and like just left in the middle of one of her rooms and was like, I'm moving back to New York, goodbye. But then she was complaining that she couldn't find any rooms to staff in after she got there. I'm like, of course you couldn't. Why would you think that would be not the case? And then the other one, he just always lived in New York and he doesn't really like LA, doesn't want to move out there. But he's like, I would go out for work, but I would never like completely relocate. So he's flexible. Uh, So there are some people who are like, I mean, New York's one of the better places to be, but if you don't want to write for late night, it's harder to staff out. That's why I ended up leaving. (laughs) Yeah. It's like a small handful of rooms that do that, but like that could change. So who knows? It does confuse me that like, even if a show films elsewhere, Mm -hmm. the room is yeah. still in LA and like you would think it would be smart to have the writer's room close to production but I don't understand a lot of things about this movie, so. <laughs> I think it's a tax thing like I know when I was getting my graduate degree in in New York my the the director of my program was like campaigning with other New York like writer performers to get better tax write-offs or deals or rebates to have to bring more rooms to New York especially for the shows that were shot there so I think it might be that where it's like a Uh, money um, thing and like subsidizing or some some yeah like subsidies I don't know insert financial math talk here but I think (laughs) that might be part of it got it I do wonder if that will also change once the pandemic has calmed down like I wonder if they're like oh it's cheaper to have the writer's room in Atlanta or cheaper to have the writer's Mm -hmm. room in Chicago like why not just have it there but also probably the largest concentration of potential television writers is already Mm -hmm. in LA because that's how the industry has been so yeah yeah it's 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 partially I think just yeah proximity and you know why be here well most of us are already here anyways so why not yeah. Maybe with, with more people getting staffed for Zoom rooms, maybe they'll start to see that there are talent pools all over and it may be worth it, you know? Yeah. I do think what will 100% still stand is like Zoom generals. Like even if you live in LA, don't nobody want to dr- sit in traffic to just to talk to someone for an hour when you can do that very easily mm-hmm. over Zoom. I think Zoom generals will stay. I think that reps will continue to be looking outside of LA for people to sign. I think even staffing meetings will continue to happen over Zoom. It was already this way before COVID that 
I was seeing so many people not having to move to LA in order to consider being staffed. Like people could get staffed from where they were, but then had to move to LA to participate in the room. Sure. So I think that will just be that you will just be seeing that even more. So just like you don't have to go out to LA preemptively, but if you're gonna stay where you are, just be prepared to have to move at a moment's notice. Because as I told you with the woke thing, they they staff the staff writers last like they go from mm-hmm. top to bottom as far as hiring so they're going to start with the higher levels the co-eps everybody and they're going to the staff writers last and sometimes like they're hiring the staff writers a couple days before the room starts it happened with both woke and queens i had like tops four days notice wow <laughs> so have a good friend ready in la that will like <laughs> let you crash on their couch i will give you like absolutely have that <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so speaking of generals, uh, something we definitely want to ask since it's a four hire series is about like your experience in generals and in interviews in writing personal statements and cover letters. Like, do you have any sort of application interview advice that maybe you've gotten, maybe that you've gleaned over doing so many yourself that you can share? Sure. I have been told that I'm very good at meetings and interviews. I do not know why. I do not prepare for them. I think I just have a personality that people like. So I guess my biggest piece of advice would be like, don't suck. (laughs) Great. I love that. That I Um, think is, take that to the bank. (laughs) Yes. Um, So I I can't help you if you are a shitty person. But what I will say is like, it's, it's not like a nine to five job interview where you're just there really to tell them like why you are going to be great for the job. So much of particularly being in a writer's room or developing a project with someone is like getting them, they're, they're going to be stuck with you long term, talking to you a lot. <laughs> and um, you want to show them that you are a fun person to be around, that you're pleasant, that you have cool ideas that you come up with the top of your head. And so Um, show as much of your personality and what makes you unique during that interview. Like, I mean, you don't have to come in like juggling or anything like that, but I would say talk to whoever's interviewing you about things other than writing. Like what other interests you have, what other careers have you had before? What TV shows are you watching? Even if it's like you're watching something, it's probably even more interesting if you're watching something garbage. Like if you're watching <laughs> Love is Blind, tell them that. Like that shows your personality rather than like, I only watch critically acclaimed WGA award nominated things. Um, <laughs> right. So that's my biggest piece of advice. Talk about yourself in ways that have nothing to do with your writing. For staffing, I mean, staffing interviews are much different than generals. Like generals, they're basically just trying to see if you're a crazy person (laughs) or if you are somebody cool that they could recommend. Um, They've probably already read your work before the general, especially if you have reps, because your reps will have probably sent your sample to them and that's why they want the general with you. But sometimes they haven't always read it. So you, you want to make them like you so that they want to read your work. I can't even imagine how many scripts execs and reps get every day and they've got to fill, give the reason to move yours to the top of the pot. Staffing meetings are different and my staffing meetings with Woke and Queens were both pretty unique from each other one because the first one was from a show that already had a season. It was a, the second season of a show. And so you have to watch the full season of of whatever you're interviewing for. It sucks because sometimes you don't get a lot of notice about the, <laughs> about the meeting. So you might have to stay up all night and binge it. But you, they're going to ask you your honest opinion about the show. You should tell them, like, don't just kiss their butt and tell them it was perfect. Like, definitely tell them the things you liked about it. But tell them that they will probably straight up ask you, like, what would you do to improve the show? Um, come up with some pitches for stories for the the cur- the season that you're being hired for. And they don't have to be, like, completely beginning, middle, end, like, story arcs. So you could do that. It, it could just be, like, I think it would be cool if this one character had a love interest or if this one character explored their masculinity more. Like, you know, whatever that is. Mm-hmm. Um, so have those ready. And then for a first season show, usually they'll send you the pilot script, possibly even a copy of the produced pilot. Make sure you watch that. For me, my Queens interview, we barely talked about writing. Like Zaheer and I just like shot the shit for 90 minutes. 
<laughs> that might be your staffing interview. So come prepared with the, similarly with the pitches and the characters you gravitate to and the more technical and storytelling aspects of what you would bring to the table, but also like they just might want to get to know you more as a person. So don't be a weird robot. <laughs> so have a personality and be prepared are kind of your two high level big pieces of advice. Yes. Mm-hmm. Valid. Yeah. Useful to know. <laughs> um, so for for our last bit, I did kind of want to talk about go to the body and and kind of how that intersects with overall what you're doing in TV, because you've mentioned you were an actor originally and then started writing more and more. Uh, you're also attached to direct your feature. So I'm curious because we've we've heard alternating views on this for emerging creators in the film industry. Like, have you been given the advice by reps, by bosses, by, you know, collaborators to pick a lane first and then expand to the other parts of the process you want to be a part of? Do you package yourself as like, I am a writer actor. I am a writer director. Like what, what has been your journey in the many types of creating that you want to do and have done in the past? This is also, you are asking very good questions. Um, I've talked to like some older multi-hyphenates and a lot of them have said up until recently, they were given the advice to like pick a lane. Like if you started as a writer, no one's going to take you seriously as a director or I mean, start, started as a actor, no one's going to take you seriously as a writer or director. So like stop doing that and like concentrate sure. on this or, you know, vice, vice versa. But now we have so many brilliant multi-hyphenate that are like busting down the doors of this industry like the Donald Glovers and the Michaela Coles and the Phoebe Waller Bridges and I think now like that's an asset I will say like you got to be good at all of them okay (laughs) like you you can't be like I wrote this thing I think I want to act in it I've never taken a class or anything before but like I just feel like because I wrote it I should be in it (laughs) like you gotta be well versed in all of the things that you were aspiring to do but I've never been told to pick a lane in fact you know when I was meeting with all these reps most of them were very excited that they could make more money off of me in in multiple different (laughs) avenues so I would say it's not it's nothing but a, a, a plus but it can just be hard to balance everything at one time like while I'm in the writer's room I can't really audition to act because it would take me out of the writer's room and I have signed a contract that I will be there. So balancing that can be a little bit difficult because you might just end up getting sucked into one thing. Um, Like you might get cast as a series regular on a TV show and then you can't be in a writer's room and you might be in a writer's room and then you can't be a series regular on a TV show. So like you might want to prioritize one or the other. Like this is like the thing that I want to do the most And if I only can do this thing, I'll still be happy, but you don't have to give up the other ones completely. It's just strategizing about like, maybe one will come before the other, maybe one will take precedence over the other before you get the opportunity to be a Donald Lover, Phoebe Waller-Bridge and Issa Rae and like do it all at the same time. Yeah, makes sense. That makes sense. Um, Obviously you were staffed not off of a spec, but like, have you seen that come up? Have your reps been like, you need to write a spec if we want to staff you for things? Have spec scripts even come up in terms of existing shows? No one has ever told me to write a spec for an existing show, Hmm. ever. Have you ever? Like no. for fellowships or anything like that? No. I was going to, several years ago, write a spec script for Insecure about one of the characters getting chlamydia and then Lawrence got chlamydia. <laughs> I, just the whole I was like, well, that means that I have the similar ideas to the people writing the show. I guess that's a good thing. But I mean, I don't think it's a bad thing to have a spec script because it does show that you can execute somebody else's vision Mm -hmm. but I don't think you need it like it's not going to cut you off from any opportunities except maybe a fellowship that requires a spec Mm -hmm. script and even many of those aren't actually requiring those anymore like CBS I think one of them is both is two originals NBC is two originals WB or HBO W time I don't know whatever the mergers of the various things are they also don't require a spec at this point so yeah, I do know, I think at least one of the writers on Woke got staffed from a spec script. Like, I think she got staffed from Broad City spec script, which ended up mm. being great because uh, the showrunner of the second season of Woke is 
one of the was one of the writers of Broad City. So oh, that's great. yeah. So I think you can get staffs off of spec, but it's not mm-hmm. like there anyone's gonna deny you an opportunity because you didn't have one. Fair enough. Um okay, well I think that's all of my questions. Christina, did you have any finals no. or follow ups? I don't. You've shared so much great. I know this has been incredible. <laughs> I talk, I'm long winded. I need to work on that, but it's good for podcasts, I think. It's great. Exactly. Yeah. No, we love that. We love to be able to just sit back and let you take over. So speaking of, uh, before we get to like plugs and where we can find you, is are there any final thoughts that you just have in general about your staffing experience that you have specifically that we didn't get to touch on? Like anything we left out? Not even about like staffing necessarily, but I feel like what people don't ask me about very much is like how to find or how to choose your rep. Mm. Because I think most writers are just like, I just want any rep to just like pay the know that I exist. Like, I don't care Mm. who it is. Like, I just want one. And that and people siding with the first person that even looks their way ends up fucking them over a lot of the time. I can't tell you how many writers I know who are unhappy with their reps. And that every time I ask them, I'm like, were they the first people to offer you, uh, to offer to sign you? And they're always like, yes. I'm like, mm, see? So because I, I know I had an extremely unique experience of having 19 options. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that kind of gave me uh, um, not only security, but it, I was like a little bit like, you have to impress me. You have competition. So I was sitting back in these interviews like, okay, tell me what you can do for me which I think everybody, everyone should have, even if you only have one interview, like you're hiring them, you pay them, they do not pay you. So they like, yes, they need to know about you and and um, want to work with you. Like it, mm-hmm. it goes both ways, but like people forget the other part that's like, you need to know how they work and how they're gonna treat you and how they're gonna advocate for you. Especially if you are, again, a writer of a marginalized identity. So do not be afraid to ask those difficult questions. Like I straight up in the interviews, because almost everybody was white with a very small number of exceptions. I straight up was like, you're white (laughs) and I'm not. Why why do you want to represent me? Do you have other writers of color? Um, How do you advocate for them differently than you advocate for the straight white men that you represent? And some of them were able to answer the, some of them, I didn't even have to answer the question. They like brought that up uh, of their own volition, which I was a plus for me. And that some of them really struggled to answer it. Some of them gave really bad answers. Uh, And so like, if I hadn't asked that question, I might've ended up with somebody who like, like one of the reps that I talked to straight up was like, well, I mean, we just like, everybody is the same to us and we advocate for everybody regardless of identity the same way. And I mean, I just, everybody just needs to be nice to each other and educate each other. And I was like, ah, oh, no, no, I'm not giving you 10% of my money yeah. to educate. <laughs> That's what Google's for. And it's free. Like, <laughs> so that is like, I, I like know that you are the shit know that like you can get jobs without reps. You don't need them. Because I got staffed without reps, uh, 50% of writers, according to the WGA, who were uh, staffed in uh, television shows, did not get their job through their reps. They got it through a referral from another writer. So there's a 50% chance that if you get staffed, it will not be through your reps. So they need to add something that you can't bring on your own or can't get through your network, and they need to prove that to you. And um, if it honestly, to me, having a bad rep is worse than not having one. So don't be thirsty. Do not sign with the first person who wants you without really thoroughly making sure that they will represent you the way you need to be repped. And it sounds like be willing to walk away if you're not getting yes. what you need. Know that if one person wants to sign you, someone else will. It might take a minute to find that person, but truly that rep really wants you, they'll come back and realize, okay, like, what, what do I need to do to be order in order to work with you? So that just saying no or not right now doesn't mean no forever. That's great. That's, That's I think great. a great piece of, of final advice is you are the shit, know your worth and don't <laughs> right. settle for anything less. So, so plugs, what are you working on right now? What do you want to tell the people and where can people follow you to find more about you and all the cool stuff you're doing? So my Twitter is um, chaotic, um, but if you want to follow it, it is <laughs> Black Ass Feminist, B-L-K-A-S-S. I'm not spelling feminist. Um, figure it <laughs> out. 
Uh, so that's uh, where you can find me on Twitter. I do sometimes share advice that sometimes people get mad about, but it's true. <laughs> the best kind of advice. And I, you know, post updates about woke and queens and, and all that stuff. My Instagram is my name, Kira, K-Y-R-A dot A dot Jones. You can learn more about my feature, Go to the Body at go to the body dot com. And that's pretty much it. If you uh, look at any of those resources, you'll figure out what the hell I'm doing at some point. <laughs> Perfect. And we'll we'll have, as always, all those links down in the description yes. box. And watch um, Queens, please. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you can binge it on Hulu. There's enough episodes out now that you can, you know, sit down and not turn off your TV for 11 hours. And right. uh, we'll, we'll be premiering later this year. I don't think they've officially announced when, but I'll just say it's spring. Great. Well, yeah, Great. we'll we'll be sure to update us and we'll definitely retweet and make sure everyone knows when things are coming out. Uh, but thank you so much, for, Kira, yeah, for, thank for you. giving us your time and and so many really great pieces of advice, some of which, you know, we didn't even have to ask you. You were just like, no, let me tell you this stuff. I mean, <laughs> yes. so thank you so much. Thank, thank you for having me. This was so fun. Thanks so much to Kelsey Rauber for our theme music, Kaylee Brown for our podcast art, Ezra Lee for editing this episode, and to all of you for listening. Links to learn more about them and our guest are in our episode description. And thank you to our booby VIPs, who are our $10 supporters on Patreon, including Kim Garland, Amanda Blunt, Anthony Epp, Kelsey Rauber, Norman Steinberg, Jerry Maravia, and Brandy Nicole Payne. If you want your name on that list and or to have access to our bonus resources related to each and every episode, you can subscribe for as little as $3 to our Patreon at patreon.com slash breaking out pod. Or join our free newsletter where we share a new creative prompt each month. Next episode, we'll be discussing episodic directing with special guest America Young. Be sure to tune in. <laughs>